president. And the president is of the view that there is some constitutional infraction. The president can then say that on the basis of some infraction on the constitution, I withhold my assent. Mr. President's letter is a diplomatic way of refusing assent to the bill. Law Weekly looks at the legality of the very contentious State of the Nation Address Bill of 2013. My guest is former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Olisa Bakuba, who in our interview segment will also share his thoughts on the legality yes. or otherwise of the recent Egyptian coup. That conversation comes up shortly, but first let's do a recap of the top legal stories in the news. I'm Shala Sheyele and the program is Law Weekly on Channels Television. Our electoral act attempts to ensure that the will of the We begin from the Court of Appeals sitting in Akure, the Ondo State Capital. Last week, Monday, the court upheld the re-election of the state governor, Lushegun Mimiko. The five-man panel of judges, led by Justice Mohamed Gumel, dismissed the petitions of the ACN candidate, Mr. Rotimi Akeridolu, and his PDP counterpart, Olu Shalaoke, on the grounds that the petitioners failed to prove allegations on the conduct of the elections beyond reasonable doubt. The judgment, which was unanimous, upheld all the judgments of the tribunal, with only one exception. The court held that the issue of voters' register as raised by the petitioners was not a pre-election matter as held by the lower tribunal, but one that the tribunal had jurisdiction to entertain. In Abuja, the federal capital territory, Justice Adamu Bello of the Federal High Court, last week Monday, voided the appointment of the nation's three service chiefs. The judge declared as illegal and unconstitutional the appointment of the Chief of Air Staff, Chief of Army Staff and Chief of Naval Staff by the President without first seeking and obtaining the confirmation of the National Assembly. Justice Baylor also granted an order restraining the President from further appointing service chiefs for the country without obtaining the confirmation of the National Assembly. The judgment was in a suit instituted in 2008 by rights activist Festus Kayamo. Mr. Kayamo had argued that the practice of sidestepping the constitutional requirements of the National Assembly in the appointment of service chiefs began under former president Olusegun Obasanjo. In Lagos, the Court of Appeal has fixed Thursday the 11th of July to hear the appeal filed by the convicted manufacturers of my Peking baby thieving mixture which was said to have killed over 80 Nigerian children in 2008. The court decided to hear the appeal after the National Agency for Food Drug Administration and Control, NAVDAC, pleaded for time to enable them file their response to the application seeking the bail of the convicts pending the determination of the appeal. The convicts, through their lawyers, are also seeking an accelerated hearing of the appeal. On the 17th of May 2013, Honorable Justice Okechuko Okeke, now retired of the Federal High Court Lagos, convicted and found guilty two men who were charged with conspiracy and sale of the thieving mixture. At the High Court in Lagos, Justice Olabisi Akinade has fixed the 16th of July for trial in the case of the former Divisional Police Officer DPO of Penn Cinema Agege, Mr. Shegun Fabumi, who is charged with shooting to death a middle-aged man. Fabumi was accused of killing Adeda Maladaramala during the protest against false subsidy removal on January 9 last year. He was arraigned for murder on May 5, 2013. Justice Akinade fixed the date after granting him bail on medical grounds. The bail was granted in the sum of 250 million naira with two shorties in like sum. Two days after the hearing in the DPO's case, trial of the alleged murderers of the late Cynthia Osokogu was stalled owing to the absence of Justice Akinlade. The court registrar told lawyers who showed up in court for the case that Justice Akinlade was indisposed. The lawyers and the registrar then agreed on the 20th of September as the next adjourned date for the continuation of the case. 24-year-old Cynthia Osokogu was allegedly drugged and murdered in a hotel room in the Amuo Dauphin area of Festac Town in Lagos in July 2012. Two men, Okwomo Nwabofo and Ulisailoka Ezike, a standing trial for the murder. And settlement talks have broken down in the protracted dispute between the Nigerian Liquefied Natural Gas NLNG Limited and the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency Nimasa. At the Federal High Court in Lagos last week Friday, NLNG accused Nimasa of frustrating the move to amicably resolve the dispute between them. NLNG and Nimasa have been locked in a fierce battle 
over the issue of non-payment of certain statutory levies and charges which Nemasa claims are due to it from NLNG. On Monday the 8th of July, Justice Mohamed Idris will rule on the application seeking to discharge an earlier ex parte order it granted to restrain Nemasa from charging, imposing, demanding or collecting the 3% of gross freight earnings or any other sums on all of NLNG's international inbound or outbound cargo ships. And we round off with the news that President Goodluck Jonathan has approved the appointment of Justice Kekere Ekum as a Justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria on the recommendation of the National Judicial Council. In a press release signed by the Acting Director of Information of the Supreme Court, Mr. Soji Oye, the approval is sequel to confirmation of the appointment by the Senate on the 26th of June 2013. Justice Kekere Ekum will be sworn in by the Chief Justice of Nigeria and Chairman of the National Judicial Council, Justice Aloma Mukta, on Monday, the 8th of July. You see, life has just got easier. You stay connected to Channels TV, where news and innovations are shaping our world. Simply log on to ChannelsTV.com to get the breaking news. Browse the homepage according to what matters to you. Tap on the extended coverage of business, sports, politics, lifestyle, infotech, entertainment, health, world news, and lots more. Click on the live link and see the news in real time. Do you want to watch the latest video of the day? It's just a click away. Friend us on Facebook, YouTube, follow us on Twitter, Google Plus, participate in Channels TV poll and share your comments. It's a website you can talk to. Your voice will be heard. ChannelsTV.com The news at your fingertips. Welcome back. The State of the Nation Address Bill seeks to compel the President to address a joint sitting of the National Assembly every year. The President has told the lawmakers that the bill amounts to a duplication of Section 67 of the 1999 Constitution, which states that the President may attend any joint meeting of the National Assembly or any meeting of either House of Assembly, either to deliver an address on national affairs, including fiscal measures, or to make such statements on the policy of government he considers to be of national importance. Now here's what transpired at the Senate the last time the issue of the State of the Nation Address Bill came up. The beginning of Tuesday's plenary was pretty much uneventful, given no indication that there would be any dissension down the line. That changed when the federal lawmakers considered the request of President Goodluck Jonathan on the State of the Nation Address Bill. President Jonathan stated that he is inclined to accede to the bill subject to some amendments. But some lawmakers faltered the request for amendment by the President. When the bill goes to the President, and the President is of the view that there is some constitutional infraction, the President can then say that on the basis of some infraction on the Constitution, I withhold my assent. He cannot propose an amendment because he is not part of the legislature. Mr. President's letter is a diplomatic way of refusing assent to the bill. He has vetoed the bill. That's what it means. And we have the right to override the veto. That is my submission, Mr. President. However, some called for caution. Where the National Assembly passes any law that is inconsistent with any provision of the Constitution, it is null and void. And so it is absolutely imperative that we take a very critical look at the provisions as cited by the President and see whether our actions were actually in conflict with the spirit of the Constitution. But a lawmaker, Senator Itayanang, called for interpretation from the Supreme Court. This is a very ripe case for the National Assembly to take a resolution and ask for the Supreme Court to interpret just this one question. The question is, can, when a bill is passed by the National Assembly and presented to Mr. President, can the President make any amendments to it, or is it just to sign or withhold assent? As emotions heightened in the chamber, the Senate President called for an adjournment, but it all went downhill from there. In the ensuing confusion which enveloped the chamber, 
two lawmakers almost exchanged blows. We're Democrats and we, we solve all the problems by talking, not by boxing. Now to get a deeper perspective on the legality of the bill, I spoke with a senior advocate of Nigeria and former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Olisa Agbakoba. He also answered questions on the death penalty and the Egyptian coup. Here's the conversation we had. Now let's start with the very contentious State of the Nation Address Bill 2013, which seeks to compel President Jonathan to address a joint sitting of the National Assembly every year. Now the President has come out to say that um, it's, it's a duplication of Section 67 of the 1999 Constitution. Now do you agree that there is a dis duplication or that it even violates the principle of separation of powers? I, th I think it has, it, has, it has many answers. It has a political answer. In other words, the President will say, can I summon the National Assembly to tell me what they are doing? So on the doctrine of separation of powers, I'm not sure that the National Assembly is right to summon the President. After all, he's the Chief Executive Officer of Nigeria. That's one. Two is six, Section 67 captures it. It provides for the President to brief the National Assembly from time to time. It does not specify the type of briefing. So I think Section 67 properly covers the field and the need for a special bill for the president to address the National Assembly is unnecessary, mm, in my view. But the clause that the president is proposing that, you know, he said um, when he's unable to um, address them, yes. he can send a letter to the speaker or the Senate president and either send his uh, vice president yes. or transmit the text of what he wants to address them about. Yes. Do you think that that clause could... Um, the president cannot be compelled to address the National Assembly. I don't think that is possible, but I, you should also look at the issue in the context of the present quarrel. It's political more than ideological. The president feels that he sends a bill on appropriation, the National Assembly tweaks the bill, sends it back, and this ping-ponging, so there is already bad blood. And when there's bad blood, people see things from different perspectives. So don't you kid yourself that what you're seeing is all that you're seeing. It's the smokes and mirrors are playing out here. There's a lot in the background that we're not seeing. Because in a conventional society such as the United Kingdom, even the opposition leader refers to himself as His Majesty's loyal opposition. Because it's been established. The rules are there. Here we have no parliamentary rules. To speak of. So anytime the president is, you know, seen to go off track, he's summoned. Anytime the any minister is seen to go off track, uh, they are summoned. So there's that, you know, misunderstanding between the executive and the legislature as to who is superior. Now it is said that the National Assembly cannot amend the Appropriation Act, neither they can, can the president. Now, the who is suffering? Nigerians. So that's the context. Talking about the appropriation bill, what's the best way to resolve that? It is the president's bill. And don't forget that section 88 of the constitution does give each side a role. But at the end of the day, the person who is best placed to set up the national budget is the president. Because he is seeing all the finance. So the lawmakers cannot tweak or add to it what is not already there? They can. Even in America, they do that. They can. They, they can tweak it. I don't, I don't agree that the president can just send the bill and the bill must come out as, as is. For instance, if the judiciary needs money in a particular area, they could see the bill and tweak it. So I think it's a participatory process where the executive produces their own bill, the legislature and the judiciary. And there must be a, some amount of tweaking. But the lawmakers have now come out to say, send a supplementary bill. It's the quarrel. The supplementary bill is the proper way to go, yes. An amendment is not the proper way to go, but it, what's in the name? You can just remove the word amendment and put supplementary. So again, 
goes back to, it goes back what to what's, been playing, what's out. playing out. There's a lot of bad blood playing out between the executive and the legislature. Now let's talk about the death penalty. I know you've done some extensive amount of work in that so regard. Yep. I know you've you also defended some death row inmates, but the recent execution of the Edo Four, that must have been disappointing for you, isn't it? I, I am disappointed in Governor Adams, very disappointed. Why did he have to do it? Why now? I mean, I, I, I personally feel, I may be wrong, but I personally feel that uh, the death of his uh, personal assistant, or in the or Lighton, who was one of us, you know, may have influenced his decision. But the debate has been like this. Cultural, religious, and other factors make you and I have different, you know, views on the death penalty. I am for abolition of the death penalty. People are for the death penalty. I respect their, their views, but I say if we put it to scientific debate, the first thing that you will find is that it, deter, it doesn't deter. So if the purpose of the punishment is to deter, it is not doing so. So what, don't, what then is the point of the death penalty? So in international circles, in particular the Geneva uh, meeting, the Human Rights Commission, international human rights organizations and national ones, including ourselves at the time was president of the CLO, we got the international community to say, let's stop the death penalty. That's the moratorium, pending when we can find a solution. And that's a long time, 15, 20 years ago. And Nigeria adopted the moratorium, so there's been no death penalty. Indeed, incidentally and shockingly, President Obasanjo himself adopted it. Shockingly. Shockingly, because I, don't, I didn't expect he would. So he did. And uh, there it was. Nothing happened until President Jonathan made a statement, which I don't know how it has played out. But you see, here's where a different political agenda affected the death penalty moratorium. In response to the rising costs of running the government, and one was just prisons. People will say, why don't you reduce your prisoners? In particular, those who have had their sentences, you know, finalized by the Supreme Court. You probably have about 15% of the prison population on death penalty, on, on death row. Why don't you sign your warrants, governors, that this is the president now saying? So whether that influenced uh, Adam Sashimoli, I don't know. But remember that the death penalty issue essentially arises out of matters in respect of which states have exclusive legislative authority. So the president cannot order the, a governor to execute anybody. So it's a really, really, really big shame that this step was taken in the face of a legal process before the Federal High Court in Abuja. Yes, I know the appeals are still pending, but what about the argument that rather than make a hue and cry over the execution and the signing of the death warrants, why not just reform the laws? But we've also said that the law provides that no body, no human, no body shall be subject to inhuman and degrading treatment. That's in the Constitution. Is that, is that, is that like a conflict in the law? There's an absolute conflict. The, my case in the Supreme Court was that to execute a person by firing squad, lethal injection, electric chair, or any other method constituted inhuman and degrading punishment. So, it is for that very reason of conflict that the Supreme Court advised, why don't you take your campaign outside of our courts? We can see your point. But it's the law of the land. So if you really feel strongly, go and clear that, that issue. And that was what took us to Geneva. And Geneva produced the moratorium. And until the moratorium is lifted, it is wrong. Not legally, but it is wrong to execute people when we've all agreed. This moratorium, it's advisory rather than legal. Whether it's advisory or binding doesn't matter. The fact was we agreed. Pacta Sunt Savanda. Pacta Sunt Savanda is an international principle that we all agreed to maintain status quo pending when we can deal with the issue of the you know lawfulness of the death penalty. That has not been you know well, now been that sorted. The has been with the sign of the what next? What next? Well, 
uh, the coalition of human rights actors who have formed a strong plank against it have decided that they will fight the case very strongly in the courts and maybe this is the time to reenact you know this debate before the African Human Rights Commission and the African courts now let's round off with the Egyptian coup what do you even make of all of that and what's the lesson for other African leaders I'll, I'll answer this in a very in a, in a in a roundabout way and I'll refer to Margaret Thatcher's book her seminal work as Prime Minister which she called statecraft and in that book she said what drove her as Prime Minister was to see that the interest, the national interest of, the, of Great Britain was always protected. So whilst it is illegal to do what the Egyptian military did, and the African Union has a declaration on it, whilst the declaration says that it coup d'etats are prohibited under Article 2 and under Article 23, that the AU has mechanisms to sanction. So ostensibly, the AU is now meeting, thinking of what sanctions we're going to we're going to we're going to isolate Egypt. We're going to remove them from all AU councils. We're going to pass resolutions. We're going to go to the uh, international you know community and pass a resolution at the UN level. That blah 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 blah. As all this is playing out, the Egyptians are saying have you asked us our opinion? Have you asked me? And Egyptians say, well, we are happy that the government of Mr. Morsi is gone. So I think, whilst I will say that the, the African Union mechanisms make it unlawful, prohibit coup d'etats, I will also say the context in which this was written was when Africa had far too many military governments. And the big political agenda then was how do we kick out these military governments. The context in which this was written. Yes, at the time it was written. In fact, it is surprising that the man who pushed for this was himself a soldier, Gaddafi. He pushed for this, you know. This has been the African Union Charter. In fact, he was the brain behind it in Citra. So, so sometimes it is referred to as the Citra Declaration, being a town in, in, um, in uh, Libya. So my problem, really, as a scholar, is to ask, what is the meaning of democracy? How has democracy, which the Charter seeks to promote, encouraged and engendered transparency and empowerment of the people? How come a non-democratic government, such as China, has enlifted and uplifted 700 billion of their people out of poverty without transparency? So, People in Egypt will ask those questions. So notionally, I do not you know, accept that the coup was legitimate. But as an Egyptian, I can see why they thought it fit to remove a government that was not benefiting them. Because if you know the history of Egypt, it's a very brief one. Gabel Nasser was leader for a long time, passed on to uh, the late Anwar Sadat, who passed on to Hosni Mubarak. At that time, you can you spoke of Egypt as a secular state, but the Muslim Brotherhood had always had the intent to Islamize Egypt. So, the opportunity came with the Arab Spring, and Mr. Morsi appeared to be popular. So he became a democrat, but in reality, a radical Muslim. So rather than promote the the, the, the common good. He was promoting, you know, extreme Islam. And the West they didn't like it because it could become a heaven for Al Qaeda. So secular Egypt, now been there. Egypt is very secular. Secular Egypt didn't like it. And they said, no, this man must go. And they got the soldiers to conduct the coup d'etat. So I don't have the answers as to whether it was right or wrong. But I think the lesson is for all all other African democratic dictators. To watch out. It won't just say, well, Article 2 says, and therefore, we will all, if you count 33 African countries, less than three or four are doing well with their so-called democracy. So the lessons for this 
uh, overthrow for African leaders to be clear. They should do well. That's where we are joined proceedings on this episode of the program. Do remember that you can log on to YouTube forward slash channels web to watch any part of the program that you missed and drop me your comments via Facebook, email or Twitter. I'm Shalashi Eli. Thank you for watching. <laughs>